Nowadays, when we hear the term remake, it goes hand in hand with other concepts like reimagining or reboot. When easy access to DVDs and online streaming make it easy to see any old movie you want, I guess most people think that simply recreating a film element by element would be kind of pointless. Not of this earth flies in the face of all that logic, since Roger Corman was such an efficient filmmaker that he couldn't resist making the exact same movie over and over again. He directed the original Not of This Earth back in 1957, and would later executive produce the 1988 remake, which used almost the exact same script. Seriously, most of the scenes are literal word-for-word -word copies of each other. Mr. Paul Johnson for 10 o'clock. That'll be for a blood test. No test. I beg your pardon? Mr. Paul Johnson, 10 o'clock. Blood test. No test. I beg your pardon? No test. Transfusion. Well, don't tell me a big man like you is afraid of a little needle. No test. Transfusion. <laughs> don't tell me a big man like you is afraid of a little needle. I have, I have no fear. fear. I came, I for, came a for a transfusion of blood. of blood. The 80s version was directed by Jim Wynorski, who is best known for Chopping Mall, Sorority House Massacre 2, and Dinosaur Island, a personal favorite of mine. According to legend, Corman shot the original version in only 12 days, and then made a bet with Wynorski that he couldn't do the same thing. Fortunately for us, he succeeded. Seeing the exact same movie made 30 years apart can be an interesting experience in its own right, but there are a few details that make the two versions very different. First, here's some plot. The story follows Mr. Johnson, an extraterrestrial secret agent on a mission to collect human blood, which is the only cure for a degenerative disease that's destroying his planet after decades of nuclear war. Over the course of the film, he lures a variety of victims back to his house for exsanguination, eventually raising the suspicions of his human live-in nurse and wisecracking butler. Once another alien arrives on Earth and is accidentally infected with rabies, our heroes determine that their employer is not of this Earth and must race to stop his murderous experiments. The parallels to the classic vampire story are fairly obvious, so much so that the characters even mention it in the dialogue. That girl was a seventh, wasn't she? Eight. Damn newspapers are having a field day. Dracula strikes again. One interesting element of the story is that the alien here isn't killing people and taking their blood because he's evil. He does it because it's the only way he can live, and the only way his entire planet can survive. You seem already aware of what's happening to you. I am aware, Doctor. If the cure is not soon forthcoming, the blood of my body will turn to dust and I will die. As a doctor, it's my job to try to cheer up the patient. That is an infantile attitude, Doctor. The sympathetic vampire trope is all over the place today, but back in the 50s, giving your monster a heroic motivation was pretty revolutionary when you think about it. Unfortunately, the story suffers from the fact that although the villain's motives are mysterious to the heroes, the audience is given a full explanation very early in the movie. As in, they literally sit you down and give a mission briefing, point by point. Your mission upon this globe is to be accomplished in five out of six phases. In the first, you will study all characteristics of the Earth subhumans. Phase one is study. In the second phase, you shall increase the quantity of Earth blood, which you are transmitting to Nevada. Phase two is more Earth blood. The result of this is that the only real suspense is during the last 15 minutes, when the characters are finally put in danger for the first time. Otherwise, we're mostly watching a bunch of people just hanging around the house. The first noticeable difference between the two versions is how they fill all that hanging around time. The 80s remake is probably best known for starring controversial actress Tracy Lords, who until this point had made only pornographic films, the vast majority of which while she was underage. In fact, this was Lords' first mainstream movie role and the last in which she appeared nude, making it one of only two movies where you can look at her tits without going to jail. Even aside from the choice of lead actress, though, the 80s version focuses pretty heavily on padding the runtime with eye candy. To give you an idea, in the original, the alien's murder victims include three drunken hobos, some random Chinese guy, and a vacuum cleaner salesman. Whereas in the remake, his victims include a door-to-door -door birthday stripper, three bosomy prostitutes, and a vacuum cleaner salesman. You can probably guess which of them get naked, though. The original's cheesecake quotient is pretty much restricted to Beverly Garland putting on a pair of nylons. How scandalous! Acting-wise, Garland provides a more compelling lead performance as Nurse Nadine, as she delivers her lines with enough of a wink and a smile to be very charming and likable as a protagonist. Plus, she's got that classic 50s horror movie scream going for her. <coughs> 
Lord's performance as Nadine is competent, I guess, but she plays the character as so professionally distant and a bit of an ice queen, rather than a relatable girl next door. I guess they thought it would be sexier that way, but it makes you care about her less. The alien in both films is meant to be a robotic and emotionless character, so it's hard to judge the acting quality. Overall, though, I'd say I slightly prefer Arthur Roberts in the remake, simply because he's a bit more menacing as a villain and shows a little more depth and variety in his performance. Paul Birch in the original has an otherworldly gravitas that is pretty cool, but his delivery is just a little too one-note, and he isn't physically imposing either. There are a few other alien characters who make a minimal impact to the story, but it is kind of funny to me that in the 50s version, the alien homeworld of Divana seems like it must be the planet of the doughy guys. It's explicitly established that the aliens don't eat except for water and nutritional supplements, so how come all the dudes look like they eat porterhouse steaks for breakfast every day? The 80s version is even sillier. Not only does the leader of the aliens look like ZZ Top for some reason, but the female alien arrives on Earth wearing a skimpy space bikini. Yeah, that's the perfect outfit to wear on your irradiated wasteland planet. Then again, it is a Jim Wynorski movie, and I would expect nothing less from the guy who brought us The Witches of Brestwick and Busty Cops Go Hawaiian. Special effects-wise, the original kept things low-key for the most part, giving the alien mental powers that were completely invisible, and no makeup effects fancier than some Evil Dead-style contact lenses. The subtlety of those effects make it kind of jarring when the alien suddenly deploys a flying squid monster to kill off an important witness. Yeah, if you've ever wondered what it would look like to be murdered by a demonic lampshade, this is it. The 80s version is far more flashy, giving the villain cool glowing eyes and lightning powers, in addition to more realistic gore effects and other nifty details. Now admittedly, it is pretty easy to have good effects when you just reuse the exact same shots from Galaxy of Terror. Seriously, that is the spaceship quest landing on the planet Morganthus, right there. As if that weren't bad enough, the opening credits are just one long stream of clips taken directly from other Corman movies. There's another one from Galaxy of Terror, that's from Battle Beyond the Sun, that's the monster from Forbidden World, those are the humanoids from the deep, and that... I don't really know what that's supposed to be, but I'm sure we'll get to it eventually on this show. Roger Corman, it's not plagiarism if you're stealing from yourself. The 1957 version clocks in at only 67 minutes, which is just the right amount of time for a plot that's little more than an extended episode of The Twilight Zone. In fact, considering the low budget and the strongly implied message of nuclear war is bad, it might as well have been an episode of The Twilight Zone. The 80s version, on the other hand, makes a single throwaway reference to AIDS in order to seem topical, but doesn't otherwise capture the zeitgeist of its time period, big hair notwithstanding. So, which version's more worth watching? It really just depends on what decade you have the most nostalgia for. The 57 original is a perfectly competent drive-in flick with a creative twist on the vampire concept and is a shorter watch for those who don't want to get too invested. The 80s version tells the exact same story, just cheesed up a bit with a synthesizer-heavy soundtrack, plenty of gratuitous nudity, and some more explicit violence. Whether you prefer your blood-sucking aliens with a side of Cold War paranoia or a bevy of big-breasted scream queens, none of this Earth is solid, campy sci-fi, and both versions come recommended. However, the Not of This Earth saga does not end here. It turns out that Corman literally remade this movie a second time less than a decade after the Tracy Lords edition. Next time, we'll look at the 1995 Not of This Earth starring Michael York and try to decide which version reigns supreme. Be seeing you. Would you like me to make dinner for you tonight? That will not be necessary. I will be dining out.